Um, so uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming uh, tonight. Um, so first, uh, first of all, a big thank you to the Act for agreeing to perform, um, and also a thanks to Northamptonshire Rights and Equality Council for um, allowing me to do this event as part of um, NREC in Northampton, and also for sponsoring the event as well. As for those of you that don't know, uh, Northamptonshire Rights and Equality Council are a um, human rights organisation based in Northamptonshire that campaigns for social justice in my local area. Um, I've also made a Padlet document for today's event, which has further reading and, and so on um, for some of the topics that we'll see tonight. Um, and a big thank you to the ACTS for sending me links and things to add to the document as well. So, um, so before I do the main intro, I want to introduce um, Ryan <clears throat> um, to the stage. Is, is, Ryan, is Ryan here now? Ryan? Hey, I'm here. How are you? Awesome. Um, so, um, so Ryan Matthews Robinson, better known as Rags CV, is a lyricist from Brixton in South London, uh, known for his amazing work, raising a close to £10,000 for the Alzheimer's Society charity for his music and events. He runs the charity organisation Poetic Unity, um, and the non-profit organisation serves to teach young people alternative ways of learning through poetry, and also provides a safe space, um, safe and friendly environment for them to perform and unite with their peers. Um, so, Ryan, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. So take hey, it. Yeah. Floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you for the intro. I appreciate it, man. Hi, right, guys. Hope everyone's good. Um, good to see everybody in the building. And I'm sorry I can't stay long for the event. I've got another event. I'm, I'm literally in Peckham at the moment. Um, I'm in my car. So <laughs> <laughs> after this event, an event that we're doing in, uh, in Peck Peckham Levels. But um. But no, it's really, I think this is a really important event. Like, Trey, big up for doing this. I think it's really important to get, you know, our voices heard. Um, and yeah, like Trey said, just quickly, like, I'm from Brixton originally. Um, and my descent is Jamaican and Irish. So, um, yeah, it's just, um, it's quite a common mix, actually. Most of the time I meet people, they're saying that they're from, they're Jamaican and Irish as well a lot of the time. So, yeah, but yeah, I'll, I'm going to perform two poems. That like, one of the poems is, based on my background and one of them is kind of based on where I grew up all right so oh. when I'm meeting someone new convos vary but the welcome is always the same it rarely changes so just him it goes something like hello hun if a girl or yo done if a male but it seems that like both of the sexes can't help asking the same old question what are you Sorry, come again? Rags, what are you? What do you think I am? Stupid man. I'm a human being. I'm an alien to you because my family are black and European. Or is it the fact that my skin is a light brown and I like to call it beige? Or just the way that I talk to you, my like I bet you 10 pounds you barely foolish ways. Listen, don't piss me off, blood. I'm no different because we're all different. I like most peeps in this room, I'm proud of where I'm from. Jamaican and Irish born in the south of London. But I won't define me. And more importantly, when you meet me for the first time, don't ask about background in the first line, because you're on a boxing stereotypical bind. Sorry, bro, you're not too advanced in the mind to fool for your ignorant kind. It's people like you, why racism is still on the rise. You ask why? Morgan Freeman said it best. Racism will come to an end when we stop talking about race. Question, why is it so important? We're all related. You can sit here debating all day long, but I won't change it. And who cares if a man's dark in the waist, he go white and love his presence? Because the character of a man that makes him a saint or something deadly. So ask yourself, if after hearing what I've said, does it make you want to be more considerate instead? If it doesn't, then to be honest, my dude, the real question isn't what am I? It's what are you? Thank you. Big up in the comments. I see you guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate you. By the way, I'm performing like, I'm not even looking to the camera. I'm just in my zone. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you look into the camera, it just throws you off a little bit. Um, so yeah, that one's based on just basically, I get that question a lot. What are you? I'm sure you guys can relate. Um, yeah, it's just like, why does it matter? But anyway, 
the next uh, poem I'm going to do um, is about the ends, about where I grew up. You see, growing up in the ends, your postcode determined your friends. And these postcode wars are real. And it's quite fitting that I think about all of this while I'm sitting at the ends, it's called the ends. Because it's literally the end of the road, man, for so many young youths. And I remember being 15, having to prove myself to this man and that man. And after proving myself to them, man, there was always the next man that was long. But you see, even though it was all the grieving old times, understanding appeal, because the ends is family. So how can you expect a road man to listen to a grown man about changing his life? And he doesn't even know, man. Yeah. He doesn't even know, man. He doesn't know about the war on the states or the rates of police brutality on black men, especially across the United States. He thinks it's to do with race, he doesn't know about losing friends to gang crime. He's one of the people who thinks so funny games to be gang signs when young youths are being killed for just looking at the next man he doesn't know. About single moms raising their sons in poverty-stricken areas and no family support and being blamed for the fact that children are ratting up, he doesn't know. What it's like to grow in a place you go home and then we get rooted all of a sudden because the government decided to gentrify the location, he doesn't know. Yeah, he doesn't know what it's like. And you're not gonna listen to someone who doesn't know what it's like. It's like learning to drive for someone who has failed numerous times and still can't ride a pedal bike. It doesn't make sense. See, I'm not saying I got all the answers, but I know when I was young and on the road, I wasn't trying to listen to a man who didn't understand where I was coming from. See, that's, not, that's why it's so important to us, man, who used to be in the street of showing that we could change our life. Yeah. See, young people can look up to us and be like, Ross, he looks like me. Maybe I can change my life. You see, there's so much potential when the youth are to tell the truth is no excuse for them, they're not reaching their goals, but don't get it twisted. They made it so much harder for us in a concrete jungle. But please, don't let the ends be the ends. Thank you. So yeah, growing up, growing up in Brixton, um, I'd be interested to know where everyone's actually from. But yeah, growing up in Brixton, um, especially when I was, I'm 35 now, by the way. I know I'm 21, but like I'm 35. Um, and growing up in Brixton, yeah, like them times there is very different. I know some of you guys might know in the building, even though all you guys look young as well. So I'm not going to presume that you're 30 <laughs> in your 30s either. Do you know what I'm saying? But it's different back in the day than what it is now. It's actually, Brixton's actually quite a nice place to go now, apparently. Um, so yeah, back in the day, it was, it was, uh, it was definitely a, an experience, you know what I'm saying? But um, big up my Brixtonites. Big up everyone in the comments. Thank you so much for showing love. Um, yeah. And I just hope that the rest of the event goes well. For I go, though, it would be nice to just know where everyone's from. Um, just a quick, and I'll put my, I'll put my, like, stuff in the comments so you guys, we can connect after this. But yeah, everyone just say your name and where you're from, I guess. And where you live and your and your background. Sorry, Trey, I'm kind of, you know, taking over the hosting duties, but I just want to get to know everyone a little bit just before I leave. So yeah, everyone just say the name, what end you're from and your background. That would be nice before I leave, if you don't mind. Yeah, the chat's just popping. It's, there's yeah, like, I can see the like, chat. Yeah, I just thought, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Northamptonshire, now London, says uh, Lace. Um, and then um, someone else said, Denise said Birmingham. Um, yeah. Martha from Manchester. Rihanna from Harrogate. Um, Celeste uh, Freeney, now, and it's from Northampton. Um, Louisa says that her heritage is Ghanaian and English. Um, mm. Gemma says she's from Manchester, but her heritage is Romani Gypsy and Polish. Um, oh, I, can see, I can see that Sylvia's put she's half Irish and she's living in Cork. That's my family that are from Ireland are from Cork. That's interesting. I've never been there yet. I'm going there this year for the first time. Yeah, I mean Ireland and mixed mixed race history. There's it's it's growing, and I think that's re that's really mm. it's re it's really necessary at this time as well. Um, yeah, Penny uh, Penny Litchfield as well said um, she's from the seaside town in in Margate. Um, okay. Jade, who's one of the acts performing later, is from York. Um, Catherine Cargill is from Croydon, but now in but Burgess Hill, originally from Uganda. Um, Red from South London. I've uh, got Rennie, but, but Rennie from Philadelphia, so you've got United States is watching uh, this event as well. Um, Cavian says Northwest London with four ends as well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ray, before, I just wanted to say quickly as well, I, I dropped um, our Instagram, my Instagram and Post Unity's Instagram, if you want to find out more about what we're doing in the comments, I'll put our website as well. But yeah, feel free to connect. I'd love to connect with you guys. 
if you're on social media, my my ads in the comments as well. So so as post unities, and then hopefully, I'll watch this event back and see what you guys have done as well. It'll be amazing to see. Ferry, thanks for having me, bro. Um, good to meet you virtually. Good to meet you. And let's catch up, guys. Have a good event. I'll see you guys all soon. Love. Um, so, yeah, that was the first act. Uh, Ryan from Brixton. Hopefully, um, I know the rest of the acts tonight will be um, just as amazing. So, um, for those of you that are just joining, uh, my name is Trey Bentor Griffiths, and I'm, I'm an Northamptonshire based um, historian and poet. Um, and academic and most of my work is in black British history but I've done a, a, a lot of work on mixed raceness in the in the UK as well um, so I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share my screen for a minute um, before uh, we have the next act just to give you the context of my background as well so go. Um, every, can someone just give a thumbs up if they can see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Can You Poet is a spoken word poetry event I started when I was an undergraduate student um, at Northampton, um, at the University of Northampton. And in its beginning, it had three aims, um, to give voice to people from historically excluded backgrounds, um, to give creatives a space to learn about social and political issues that impact our lives. And finally, to give a side of poetry that also contradicts the mainstream education system narrative. So many of us who went to school in this country would think that possibly poetry um, was like for the page. Um, and I know in school, I didn't learn about performance poetry, for example. So I learned Shakespeare, um, Wilfred Owen and war poets quite are people like Carol Ann Duffy as well. And that was the narrative of poetry I was given in the school system. And it was only when I left school that I began to see that there was spoken word poetry, which was more, more what I was interested in and what appealed to me as well. Um, the most recent Can You Poet was last, was actually last summer, because um, it's the first time I've had time to actually put effort into organizing these events and so on, uh, because I've just started a PhD and it's, it's consumed my life as well. So that's what I'm focusing on at the moment. Um, past topics for these events have also included mental health. Uh, I know Kezabel is, is watching from Ketrin as well, Northamptonshire, and she hosted um, one of the previous events, which was on, on the mental health stigma as well. Um, decolonization I've talked about before, um, identity and others. And these events um, take topics that have been discussed in settings like academia, uh, but have made them more accessible to sort of non-academic viewers, uh, much in the same way that public intellectuals have done in the Black British history space. Um, for, for example, how some documentaries since 2020 have presented topics in a reachable way, um, decentering things like journal, like journal, academic journals um, that are often inaccessible to people who don't have a university affiliation. Um, simply, I chose art talk about such subjects. And this session aims to give voice to mixed heritage poets and storytellers um, talking about mixed heritage in a UK context. Um, so some of the acts you hear tonight will be experienced creatives, whilst others may be reading for the first time. I ask, just ask that everybody on this call just remain respectful and listen. Um, the chat function is open, um, so please use it to, um, um, talk about the poems, but also to, to network and um, exchange socials and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the inspiration for this event comes from the many conversations I've had with mixed heritage friends and colleagues. Um, so, for example, people like Esther Stimson in Northampton, uh, Charlene Townsend, and also Natasha Wesley, uh, my family friends, Eva and Yana Truckula as well, and my cousin Paris Ventor. Um, this comes in addition to a prior edition of Can You Poet, which was on South Asian heritage and identity, hosted by my friend um, Shabnam Anam, which is also available online, which I'll, I'll put in the chat as well. Um, at this event, uh, many of the acts um, of South Asian heritage were also um, 
also of mixed heritage background. So many of them were South Asian, but also had one white parent as well. And this interlocks my family history as, as someone that was born in the UK of, of Jamaican and Grenadian heritage from the Caribbean uh, that has a history and present of many peoples as well. So in popular media, many of us um, would have seen also the, the racist uh, bio being published um, about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and their relationship as well. Uh, media discourse situates racial and cultural mixing as a new occurrence in Britain, not something that has been present um, for many, many centuries. Um, so in, the in 2011, the census also stated that 1.2 million people in England and Wales um, identified as coming from a mixed heritage background. Um, now we see media adverts of mixed couples uh, by companies implying that mixedness, um, racial mix mixing and multiculturalism are a vital part of British popular culture. And none of this is new, but there, I think there is an amnesia uh, because of the way successive gov governments have used the education system to miseducate swathes of the public on this on this issue or topic. Um, with the Afro-Romans, for example, in places like Cumbria in the third century, uh, one might think there are places today that are whiter than they were um, nearly 2,000 years ago. There were mixed heritage individuals in the days of the Tudors, further to the 18th century, with people like the aristocrat Dido Bell pictured um, in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, working class people like Edward and Walter Tull in the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century, um, as well as the brown babies of the 1940s in the 20th century, born from mixed unions between black American GIs and local white women. Um, unions between Asians and white British people um, also took place between white Britons and Indian and Chinese people in the 20th century. Uh, for example, the families of Chinese men and white British women were split up in the 1940s um, due to government deportation schemes as well. Similarly, black men and their white spouses were met with like violence in the 1920s. And these racist um, policies of immigration set the tone um, between 70 and 100 years ago for today's debates around refugees and asylum seekers, um, the Nationality and Borders Act, and also the Windrush scandal as well. Uh, following the First World War, uh, white terror campaigns could be found in as many as nine seaport communities across Britain, including Liverpool, London and Liverpool. In Cardiff, uh, white men reacted violently when they saw black men courting white women. In some settings, mixed unions were also stigmatized and the children were discriminated against as outsiders. Um, aided along by people like the social researcher, uh, Muriel Fletcher, who in 1930 uh, released a report that did as such in Liverpool and other cities. Um, her report was so um, contested as well by the black community in Liverpool that she left, she had to leave the city as well. The media debacle over Harry and Meghan has forced many of us to revisit this history of racial mixing and for some of us to consider this history for the first time. Black people, brown people and white people have been negotiating the same spaces in Britain for some time. The Afro-Romans who undoubtedly lived amid local white populations. Um, the black people in early modern England where Elizabeth I wanted to expel black people from her kingdom. Um, or was it the Asians that lived in, in, in Elizabethan England and through the 19th century? I mean, the Black Georgians and the Black Victorians, and also the local white populations. Leading into the 20th century, with two world wars, um, early multiracial labor movements in the 20s, um, also linked with the eugenic movements, the rise of eugenics in the 20s and 30s, then into the Second World War, the Brown Babies and the Windrush, and more post war arrivals who then had children and continued this mixed history. Uh, with Britain's history of cultural and racial mixing, um, organisations like the Mixed Museum uh, exist to document and distribute it to the public. Uh, recent published work by people like um, Afra Wahash, Remy Adekoya, Natalie Morris, David Olasoga, Lucy Bland, and the late historian Imtiaz Habib, and many more, is predated by books like Mixed Race Britain in the 20th Century by Camille Clabourne and the late Peter Aspinall. 
and also mixed race amnesia by Manel Mahatani. Many much loved areas of Britain's history are populated by people who married outside of their race, and outside of their culture as well. In today's world, there are more spaces for mixed heritage people um, to know each other and to connect with each other, um, like the mixed girl meetup, for example, and also critical mixed race studies as well in the academic context. Uh, people have been coming and going to this country um, for centuries. Britain's history is one of mixing, and the recent 20th century is just one chapter of um, a longer subtle history. And um, this brings me on to the second act of tonight, who is Louisa Adjua Parker. Um, Um, Louisa, um, who is a writer, is a writer of poet, is a writer and poet of English and Ghanaian heritage, um, who lives in the southwest of England. She is the author of several books, namely poetry and short stories, which I will set. I've attached to the Padlet document, which I'll link in the chat. Um, and she has a coastal me coastal memoir forthcoming with Little Toller Books. Uh, she has also run many creative writing workshops and has been shortlisted as well as having formed her work in the Southwest and beyond. Louisa has written extensively about ethnically diverse histories and racism in the countryside. And as well as writing, um, she works as an equality, diversity and inclusion consultant, and she's a sought after speaker and trainer on racism in the country, black history and mental health as well. Um, so Louisa, um, the, floor, the floor is yours, so take it, take it away. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction and good evening, everyone. It's really funny, actually, as you were talking about the history, I was just reflecting on the fact that I didn't know. I thought I was one of the first mixed heritage people in the country ever to exist until I was about 30 and started learning about um, black history and history of Asian people and so on. So, yeah, it's just really weird to think that I, I genuinely believe that until I was about 30 years old. So my poetry, it's not really performance poetry, it's I'm reading from, from my books and um, it's very different to, to Ryan's. I've had a very different experience because I've lived in the Southwest um, most of my life now since I was 13, so almost 40 years. Um, and that's really why I began writing because I was one of the only people around who wasn't white for many years, apart from my siblings. And I, I really struggled with that. And I, that's really what led me into writing poetry. I wanted to share that experience with the with the wider white community. And since then I sort of widened out to think of other marginalized groups and have more of an intersectional approach, I think, to my work. So I'm gonna begin with a couple of short poems from um, a collection called She Can Still Sing. And I wrote this after the, 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 um, the death of a, of a very dear friend who, she was also of mixed heritage. She was Swiss and Malaysian Indian, and she's sort of a family friend and she really struggled with her mental health for, for many, many years. And she, she took her life four years ago. So I wrote this collection in, in honor of her. So uh, we both lived in Lyme Regis for a time. I don't know if anyone knows Lyme Regis, a very small seaside town. So this is called Dancer. We'd part our hair in two, yours thick black waves, mine curly frizz, and wear it in two buns atop our heads like Minnie Mouse's ears. We'd stick red bindies on our forehead, foreheads. They seemed at home, fine paste jewels on our brown skins. We wore platforms on our feet. I coveted your buffaloes. We danced in half dark spaces, moved to the sound of bass, your boyfriend spinning records on black decks, our cheeks sparkling as flecks of glitter caught the light. This other one is also about how we tried to, because we were different to the community around us, we tried to sort of create our own culture and we had the, we've got these uh, djembe drums that we, we take to the beach. So I wrote a poem about that as well. Djembe. We take our djembe to the beach, sit on sand, bang out rhythms, the hollow slap of skin on skin bouncing off the rocks. We teach our children how to play. Once you took my daughter busking. How I'd longed for one. The wood, hard blue rope, bits of goat fur still attached. You bought it for me. And when we drummed together, people gathered round us as though we were a fire. I've got some from my, um, I don't know if you can see, there's a beautiful picture that I had commissioned for this collection, How to Wear a Skin. And it's of a, of a woman with brown skin with the landscape embodied in her. And this was by Jennifer Ho. And I really, I really love that. So I wrote this collection 
it's partly about my experience, but also about taking inspiration from other people's stories as well. So this first one, a bit of a content warning. So I do talk about uh, sort of previous racism. And I wrote this as part of a project with a fantastic poet called Josephine Corcoran. And we wrote, um, we looked at the language around the, the Leave campaign um, in the EU referendum and we performed this, we wrote and performed these pieces for the Enemies Project. So this is called Take Back Control. One, take children from their mothers, wrap them in chains and brand their skin. Take half the world and wash it pink. Take history, take lives, take racism and smash it into chips. Take gold, take spices, land. Take food and let them starve. Take the best bits of other people's cultures. Take race and slice it thinly into cards. Take truth and replace it carefully with lies. Two, back to a golden age, a glorious time of Pakistani bashing, the stampede of Dr. Martin feet, shaved heads and swastikas of making England great again back to a time of waving flags, shouting go home to anyone who looks as though they might be foreign. Back to a time before political correctness went mental and stitched good English lips with silence. So they had to preface every sentence with, I'm not a racist, but back to a time before England, like a sober friend, laid her hand on forearms in pubs across the land, said the pained smile and shake of her head, bruv, not cool not cool at all. Three, control the borders, build a wall so we can keep them out. Control the hordes, the floods, the swarms, the waves of foreigners who wash ashore our islands. Control the welfare state, do not give money to the undeserving. Control the immigrants who run around like cockroaches with pincer hands and dark shine bodies, taking things that don't belong to them, our jobs, our homes, our way of life, back to their filthy vermin nests. Um, so this one is written after a poet who wrote a brilliant poem called Four Girls, I believe, and she was writing about the very serious um, grooming and abuse of the young girls and women in Rotherham, Rotherham and Rochdale. So I wrote this after her, but it's not, it's, I don't want to take away what she was writing about. This was just my, my experience and it was not anything like as as horrendous as, as the one that I modelled my, my poem on. I just loved the form, and I, so I co sort of copied it, basically. Um, so this is called One Girl After Helen Frame, and I wrote this about being of mixed heritage, a teenager in Devon. Her skin is butterscotch angel delight, and her hair a nest of spun burnt sugar, and her eyes espresso shots, and her best feature, and she's free as a girl in the sky, and she's 17 like festivals in Cornwall and smoked filled tents and mud and ease. And she's sad like George Michael on the radio at Christmas and Snoopy's ears and her mum's eyes. And she's come through adolescence like a big dipper. And she's tired like old slippers and scared like Freddy Krueger's fingers. And she loves like her heart's made of steel. And her face is a harvest moon in a navy sky and she's wild like gorse on the moors and delicate as spider webs at dawn. Her hands want other hands to hold them and her lips are big like goldfish and her legs are lumps of clay and nothing like a model's and her belly's soft like kisses and her heart is blue blown glass and one man like a black eyed starling digging for worms in the dawn. I'm not sure I'm doing for time, but this one is about a five minute poem, I think, or, or around that. So, um, so this one I wrote in the period after the murder of George Floyd back in 2020. And I don't know about everyone else, but I found it incredibly overwhelming, real burnout, um, really struggling with mental health, constant friends, people getting in touch with me, wanting me to do stuff. And I, anyway, I was just really not in a great state, but I wanted to write this poem and I basically wrote it to say to all my white friends what I didn't dare say before. So this kind of summarizes many years of frustration, not being able to speak, and then suddenly, actually I could. So this is what I wrote. Dear white West Country people, to the southwest, sorry, to the white southwest boys with wet mouths full of slurs, white boys to whom I was barely a girl, to the white teacher who informed me I wasn't too bright, to the white friends who liked me but weren't bothered to fight, 
to the white kids who stuck dirty hands in my curls, to the white boys who insulted me, but not the white girls, to the white boys who told me my legs were like trees, whose words were cold rivers, whose words were cold seas, to the white friends who'd remark on my hair, weight or skin, to the white friends who assumed black friends were my kin, to the white friend who told me I was fat at nine stone, to the white men who left me to raise children alone, to the white strangers in pubs whose head snapping got bolder, to the white friends who said I had a chip on my shoulder, to the white friends who silenced me, stitching my lips, to the white friends who didn't stop all the poisonous drips, to the white friends who'd call me coloured or half caste, to the white people in blackface, vile thing of the past, to the white friends I grew up with in this green and white space who never had to think about their colour or their race. To my white friends who listened, you know who you are. Thank you for your allyship, this is only the start. To the white friends who told racist jokes in the pub, to the white men who found me unworthy of love, to my children's white teachers who left slurs on the wall. There are too many to list, I can't list you all. I understand, although you had choices, those choices were made in a culture where racism never quite fades. I get it's hard to walk in my shoes. You can't wear my skin. I don't blame you. I love you. I am you with your kin. We've walked over the same patch of green velvet land, walked along the same river banks, walked on the same sand. We've seen the same seasons changing, parched land give birth. We've seen snowdrops and bluebells pushing up through cold earth. We've watched the same cattle, heads bent to the grass stood by the same sea, that sheet of blue glass. But I walked in my shoes and you walked in yours, not stopping to think or to fight for the cause. And now is the moment perfect for growth, to pull up the roots of the hate that was sown. It's time to admit you're no expert on race, but an expert on whiteness and keeping your place in a system that keeps whites right at the top and us at the bottom, but that needs to stop. Not being a racist is no longer enough. It's going to take work and it's going to be tough. Examine your whiteness, which some wear with pride. Has your skin color caused you to fear for your life? You'll need to relearn our history from 400 years and it's ugly and dark and you'll have to face fears. It's a movement of thousands and you can take part, but you need to feel this, feel it deep in your heart. You're mourning George Floyd, but what of the others? Brand their names on your heart, our lost sisters and brothers. You might have just noticed it. We've lived it for years. It's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to take tears. But we belong to these days and we belong to these hours. You can make new choices and you do have the power to dismantle old structures, to tear them apart, make way for the new, create space in your heart. The change that's been coming is finally here. It should fill you with hope, not fill you with fear. Let us rise up like birds. Let us soar through the sky. Let us breathe. Let us live. Let us hold our heads high. Let us walk proud and belong to this land. Walk with me, friends, allies, come, take my hand. Thank you so much for listening, thank you. There's loads of amazing comments in the, in the chat. Thank you so much. I felt so, when I wrote that and it went out on um, BBC Dorset, I think I did a little piece with the local journalist. I was so nervous. I didn't know what people were going to say, but actually my, my wife, I got a lot of negativity on Facebook, obviously, but um, my actual friends, people who knew me were really, really supportive. So it was, it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So shall I hand back to Trey for the next, next act? Thanks a lot, um, Louise, for that. I think Thank I can you. speak for everyone when I say that was, ama that was an amazing poetry set. Um, Thank you so much. And I think that's even, even that is an understatement. Um, and I'm going to introduce the next act right away. And the next act is um, Red Medusa. Is Red Medusa ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm good to go. Okay. And Louisa, that was, excuse my language, but that was bloody spectacular. Honestly, that was just, that was, 
yeah I felt that thank that you. last thank one so I felt that like respect and love to you yeah. that was thank brilliant you. brilliant thank you Trey um uh, should I introduce myself I've got I've got your introduction so I, I'm happy to introduce you yes I oh, hate introducing myself please do <laughs> I'm rubbish uh, I always forget things about who I am but go ahead uh, the next act is someone I who I was connected with um, via a mutual friend in the poetry circuit. So um, some of you might know um, Gary Huskerson, who runs Poetry Things out of Peterborough. Um, and Red Medusa is a UK born academic and artist passionate about health injustices, um, decoloniality, and the radical transformation of dominant research methods. She is currently studying um, for a doctorate at Queen Mary, University of London, and her research uses poetry um, and centers decolonial research methods to explore and platform um, disadvantaged women's health experiences during the first COVID-19 lockdown in March 2020. Um, so yeah, Red Medusa, the floor is yours. I think I need you to pitch my um, my PhD for me, Trey, because <laughs> bloody hell, I, can, I can't even get it in a nutshell like that. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody, for being here um, to listen to this vast array of amazing wordsmithery. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about me. I'll, I probably should say that, first of all, I, I have never been comfortable with the term mixed race. Um, because I understand the the origins of the word and weapon weaponization of race um, and it being you know this biological yeah. myth as it were my um, I I've always referred to myself as a black woman of dual heritage um, I was exclusively raised by my Barbadian family um, and grandparents specifically um, so the word mixed race has never really fit me it's never really resonated um is there anything else I need to say um yeah and I have a website poetrybyredmedusa.co.uk just look it up I hate talking about myself it makes me really uncomfortable I am spectacular though as spectacular as Louise's poetry I will say that much um <laughs> I have been described as many other things but spectacular is definitely one of them I'm gonna open up um I'm just gonna do two poems um I'm going to open up with a poem called Asterix. Um, I'm sure many of you have encountered the box that says other with an asterisk. Please outline what you are or where you're from or blah, 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 or what gender you are or what. I'm fed up of it. So this poem came from that frustration and it goes like this. I am not an asterisk, an afterthought, something other that's a little bit different. A blank space on your form where my black is not the norm. I do not represent the spaces between B, A, M and E, an ethnicity with no name. I am not an asterisk. I am not a by the way or a covert way to say that I do not fit into your prescribed divisive European ideals of false supremacy. I'm not an outlier. I'm not outside of anything. If anything, I'm the all in everything. I am that which you say does not exist. I am not an asterisk. I am not the acceptedly light black woman you employ to prove your organization is not racist. I am not an embodied get out clause to meet your quota. I am not your equal opportunities promoter. I am not your poster girl for how much you say you love the, the poor or the blacks or the browns. I am not your one black friend and I am not your office clown. I am not, my, my presence does not give you, I'm not your foot in the door to black culture. My presence does not give you permission to speak to me in Patwa. I cannot be summed up in biro in a boring patriarchal white box ticked. I am not black other. I am not mixed other. I am the sum of my ancestral mothers. I am the strength of all, including you, Trey, of my brothers. But I am not an asterisk. Thank you. Number one. I know you feel that. I know everyone in this room knows that frustration, right? Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to a poem that I've never performed, ever. Um, I wrote this last year. Um, I am a seasoned performance poet. I've been writing poetry since I was 
eight. I am now 38, so it's been a long time. Um, and uh, I rarely, rarely share poems that I'm not familiar with. But funnily enough, Trey and family, um, I was going through my Facebook memories today and I was thinking, what set, what set am I going to do? I need to find one that fits, right? And in my memories, this poem came up and it was perfect. And I thought, wow, how, 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 what's the word? What's the word, Trey? Um, fitting and uh, there's a bunch of other words that my autistic brain can't quite pluck from the air right now. Appropriate. That one, but also the synchronicity of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just fit. And again, like I said, I've never, I've never performed it before. So I'm going to share this with you. Um, and it's a poem that speaks to my upbringing, um, my mother's battles being a black woman in at the time where you know mixing races as it were was massively looked down upon um so this is called about dad and it goes like this when he dies he dies i will not cry there will be no salty tears my heart will not allow it i don't feel bad for saying it out loud I'll allow these words to glide off my lips with such effortlessness when I'm told that they should be buried with him. Buried with the harshness of abandonment at birth. A burning sand that lives under the glare of my shine, scolding my feet whenever I walk in my greatness. Oftentimes I wonder how it's possible to miss a stranger and how others can ask me that I forget that he existed as if I were the product of asexual reproduction, as if my mother, black, working class and woman, Barbadian daughter of the Windrush, African granddaughter of the kidnapped, would cause for herself a life of work and ridicule. Void of the balance and shared responsibilities of two loving parents. Oh, how she loved the feel of dry, scrunched up newspapers in her shoes, keeping the rainwater out and her tired toes in. How she adored the constant stirring and serving of cornmeal porridge for breakfast, lunch and dinner, the reducing of roast chickens into soup and then into stews that would last at least a week between three mouths, though she only ate of poverty once a day. How she enjoyed those dirty looks from entitled Caribbean men who insisted and still insist that her body belongs to them. They called her a coconut, a sellout because she dared to raise the baby that a white man abandoned and joy such thanks for the queries from white women who asked how much she charged to babysit, having seen a half caste baby in a pram next to her dark skinned brother. Thank you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, the reason I love that poem is because as you all probably know, well, those of us that hail from African and Caribbean communities, the line is often that black men abandon their children, right? We hear it all the time, this narrative. But I needed to challenge that because that's what my dad did. And this is the background as to why I do not and will not identify as mixed race and will always identify first as human, second as woman, and third as a black woman of dual heritage. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I probably should plug my book. I don't do that often enough. This is my chat book, Breathing Water. Um, it's essentially about, it's about, it's a book of poetry based on black feminist principles, right? Um, it's got, like Louisa, some of my personal experiences in it. Um, some of the experiences of women and people I know, there's a talk, there's talk about the, the so-called migrant crisis. In essence, it's an exhalation of anger and outright outrage, um, and also a hailing of the ancestors that allowed for us to be here today and survived what they survived so we could be here now together. Um, so it's on Amazon, it's called Breathing Water. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm gonna stay around for a bit longer and then um come yummy come and then um yes it's fine and then sorry i'm also a mom of two <laughs> so um yeah and yeah so go get the book if you want it um i'm on socials as red medusa there's only one of me you see my face so you know you know what i look like and this is yumea everybody say hi hi <laughs> and this I is the new beautiful. this is 
Did you hear that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is wow. going to be the generation that we inspire to, yes. to turn this stuff around, right? This is yes. who we do this for. Yes. Right? Yes, so definitely. Yes. I'm glad you got to meet my princess as well. My little man's in his in his room playing games. Um, but oh. yeah, I'm, I'm going to stick around for a bit longer. I'm looking forward to hearing as much poetry as I can gather. Um, and I, you know, thank you again, um, Trey, oh. for your work and for everybody for having me. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thanks for that, Ray. That was really powerful. And I know I've seen you perform a bunch of times before. Um, and it always you always blow me away. Always. Um the next act is not a poet, it's the it's our featured speaker for tonight. Um I first met Rihanna, I think it was a few months ago at an event at Loughborough University. Um and she has some of like the, the, her, her work ethic is probably one of the most prolific I've, I've ever seen in, in anybody. Um, and someone that I respect loads, who I've seen just doing amazing work um, in, in the anti-racism space. Um, so Rihanna Garrett is uh, a Chinese mixed heritage, um, PhD researcher and race equity activist at Loughborough University. Um, investigating the underrepresentation of racialized minorities in UK higher education. Uh, in her award winning activism, she has focused on anti racism within sports clubs and societies, uh, freedom school spaces for racially, minority, racially minoritized student, students, and empowers students to enact their own activism within institutional spaces. Uh, she is passionate about telling stories of and highlighting her mixed heritage experiences to represent the complexities of race in UK contexts that are often ignored. Um, so, Rihanna, everyone, um, and I've got a shared screen because I know she had some slides as well. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Um, should I just ask when to, yeah, to move just, the, the slides? Yeah. I am not in control, but that's fun. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much for that introduction, Trey. And just, I, I feel like I need a minute because <laughs> the emotions that I'm feeling right now, nothing has ever resonated with me as much is the poems that have been read so far and I'm sure the ones that will come after as, as well because these, these are very new feelings as, as someone who's been in academia pretty much my entire life where these things are not something you can easily access or you have to find outside of that space to have it is such a powerful thing and it almost makes me quite angry that this is not something that we have through that entire experience so I just yeah, I want to thank everybody and I can't wait to to read and hear more of, of what everyone's going, going to be doing. I think one of the things I find really important about these sorts of events um, is just being able to express personal identity, which is so important within mixed heritage identities in general. Um, I know as someone who is often uh, misidentified or identified by other people, these kinds of outlets are, are really useful to express personal stories to really understand the the racial intricacies that come with navigating these different social arenas that that we're in and the only way that we can sometimes articulate racism's invisible touch almost is by defying the whiteness that it's set within that often denies this lived experience due to lack of proof but through poetry, storytelling, artwork, performance, we don't need proof. We just need to be here. So I'm just so grateful for all of that. And that's my emotions coming out. So <laughs> um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So I thought I'll just have a little introduction to my family history and to my racial background as this is usually the most kind of questioned element of 
of who I am, especially within my, my realm of work. So as Trey said, I'm Chinese mixed heritage. Um, I sometimes use mixed race and mixed heritage interchangeably, but as reasons was, that were stated before, I changed mixed race to mixed heritage um, because of the biological connotations to, to race. And I much rather resonated with, with heritage myself. Um, but sometimes I use it interchangeably because it is quite a recent change in my language. Um, so I have family based all over the globe. So you can see in some of these pictures here. So they're in Singapore, America, Australia, Taiwan, Bali, all over the UK and, and many more. My mother um, is a Chinese woman, the woman sat closest to me in a lot of these adult pictures. Um, she was born in Indonesia, raised in Kano, Nigeria, and educated in London. And my father is white British. So as you can see from a lot of these family images, I feel like I look very different and I stand out. I don't look like the rest of my family in a lot of my pictures, even when I was a child. But even before the blonde hair, um, there was a distinction from my Chinese family, my white family and me. But this is what a lot of mixed heritage families in Britain will look like. So I have two half brothers. We have Robert. He's also mixed heritage like me. Um, he looks a lot more Chinese than me um, and he looks more like my mother than I do. And then I also have another brother who is a six foot five white man who you would never guess has any relation to me in any close proximity. So my brother and I, Robert, we are the only two mixed race people in our entire family that we're aware of, making it an experience that we both had to figure out by ourselves. There's also a 10 year age gap between us. So it's not something we could have done together. But I am lucky to have him is when we would go to what I would call white Christmas and Chinese Christmas, depending on the family that we were with. We felt very out of place either way, despite being extremely close family relatives. I think one thing that many families have shared is their joint racial experiences, but not mine. Mine was filled with racial ignorance, a lack of education around what racism was, and overall, no idea how to raise a Chinese mixed heritage girl in a very predominantly white space, who would shockingly grow up to dedicate her academic career to race equity, and I have no idea how that happened. So in terms of family history, so my, my father's side is very, very quick. He basically was raised in Harrogate, North Yorkshire, I went to the same high school he did when it was a private boys school and has not left the, the confines of his of his hometown. Whereas on my mother's side, this is when it becomes a bit more complicated. So my mum was born in Indonesia in the 1960s. She lived with her parents, sisters and brother um, and they ran a restaurant. And because they were Chinese in an anti-communist Indonesia at the time, there was a target on their backs. My mum recalls the family having to change their surname from Chinese ones to Indonesian ones. They were banned from learning Chinese, even though my grandfather or my gungung would teach them anyway. And having all of her Chinese books burnt in front of her and not knowing why. My family were relatively wealthy within the context of the country's economic um, position, which was not a positive thing within um, the Indonesian community's eyes. And they had noticed that a lot of families that looked like mine started to go missing. So my gungung had to make a very quick choice to either remain in Indonesia, go back to China, or join the family that we had in Nigeria. So then the whole family picked up and moved to Nigeria where they all went to school and were taught English. I bring this up because this whole migration decision changed the entire dynamic of this entire family and the legacy that it would leave behind. My mum recently told me that when she returned to Singapore, where most of my family live, for a funeral, she realised that she could get by with Chinese, Cantonese. You know, many of the members of my family actually only speak English. Some of them only speak Chinese. But most interestingly, um, her uncles who stayed in Indonesia when my gungung decided to move, their kids only spoke Indonesian and she wasn't able to communicate with them despite being so closely related. And for me, this shows how culture and language are related, but they're not entirely connected. And often we try and use language as a test of ethnic legitimacy, which is a huge part of my own experience as well. 
tied to that a few weeks ago I had friends uh, a dinner with a friend and I told him that the Chinese element of my family was my mother and he was shocked because he thought it was going to be something much further removed and it took him a few moments for it to settle in really reflecting on what he had been taught or what he understood race to be before he was given that information so that leads me kind of nicely to my next points which would be more about how my identity has interacted with different spaces and the people within them and it really highlights how racial understanding depends on the social and political context that it is being read within the next slide please So I base a lot of what I talk about on quotes that I've been told, and I think so many mixed race or mixed heritage people can relate to, to all of them. So this quote in particular really resonates. It is such a significant part of my life because it's a reminder of how people don't see me for how I see myself. So I used to play polo. I'm on um, a horse called Catalina. Um, and it's a sport that's often described as the sport of kings, which I absolutely hate. I did not know this when I started, just to point that out. And I just really see this club almost as a microcosm of a wider middle upper class white British society, as they really visibly choose who to include and exclude within that space. Poir argues that this whole notion of Britishness is imagined as authentically white, usually male, and is seen to hold this element of power because it lacks this almost racial burden. But still there is a distinct lack of understanding of what whiteness is in the first place. This also brings in concepts of colorism, especially in proximity to whiteness in the UK. So colorism refers to those with darker skin can experience disadvantages compared to those with lighter skin, creating complexities within both those in proximity to whiteness as well as within racial groups. One of the examples that I always use is I went for drinks one evening to celebrate our nationals competition. And a girl turned to me and asked me if I was Chinese. And I said, yes, because I am. That should be enough for people to understand my identity. But then she said, no, you're not really Chinese then, are you? And this happens to me on quite a regular basis. It's happened within my PhD experience in a lot of different spaces with different people physically comparing me to monoracial bodies, people asking for proof to get me to speak Chinese where they don't know the reality of my family's history that really stunts me to do so. If you can move on to the next one, please. So, what I find really interesting that in the same space, I'm also as ethnic as they're willing to go. In the same club, I was on an all white committee and they were attempting to find a scholarship for that year to pay for our nationals competitions and socials. We went to Sports England, which required us to talk about the diversity of the club. And in that moment, the president turned to me and he says, well, Rihanna, you're up. And everyone laughed and I didn't. My partner at the time joked about how I was as ethnic as that club was willing to go. He said to my face that only a mixed heritage woman was allowed to enter this space and they needed me for the sponsorship money, but they didn't need my Ch Chinese identity for anything else. They had decided how ethnic I was allowed to be in that space. And it really made me question, how can I be identified in so many different ways on such a passionate level in similar spaces where I get comments such as, do you eat that soup? And all of you are the same anyway. I remember being afraid to walk down the street in daylight when all the racism was going around about Chinese people and COVID-19. There were Chinese people being beaten in the street just a few blocks from where I was living. I do recognize that I have a privilege being quite white passing a lot of places and the privilege that whiteness can bring. But then this made me realize that that whiteness can only protect me to a certain extent. And I don't always get to choose when that is. And it's usually arguing that I was either white or Chinese, but very rarely both. Um, next slide, please. 
So I think this one is also very relatable um, because when it is both, this idea of exoticism comes into play. So this picture here um, has a really lovely creative representation of how mixedness is experienced, showing a student representation of how they felt commodified as a product rather than seen as a person. Because of my racial ambiguity, people can't always immediately assign me a racial stereotype. I'm often described as a tan white woman because apparently that's all of the rage right now. I've had women in the gym come up to me and ask me what fake tan I use. My skin is not the next beauty trend for you to follow. And my Asian descent is not an exotic fetishization for you to pine over. Mixed bodies are often marked as this sexually deviant and exotic as they can't be offered these stereotypes, but it is not a compliment. And I've been called everything under the sun in terms of a compliment, but it's usually in the same way that you describe a fruit. Even when I was 16 years old, I worked in a Chinese restaurant where my job was just to stand there and look Chinese for an authentic feel, which was very problematic in the first place. When I saw a table of six or so men putting large sums of money in the middle of the table before they'd even started their meal. And it turns out they were putting bets on what my ethnicity was. Another good example of this is how mixedness is described and interacted with on shows such as Love Island. It's very popular to have mixed race contestants do really well, in particular black mixed race cast members because of this ambiguity. However, you compare this to a lot of monoracial contestants, whether that be from Asian descent who don't do as well as the white contestants or many of the black men and women who are often left alone. By calling people exotic and othering their bodies, you're also referring to the fact that it's not a normal beauty standard of white women that they're usually used to. It's much like telling people that they prefer blonde and blue eyes, which means they prefer white women. The next slide, please. So I wanted to end it on more of a, a positive note and highlight the importance of, of hearing these mixed heritage experiences. I talk about these instances of discrimination to show these complexities but it's not the whole experience. I love being mixed heritage. It's such a fundamentally beautiful thing that brings me so much joy. It is who I am. It creates spaces like this and you hear the creative artwork that is coming from each and every person. And I'm aware that sometimes I need to avoid what I've recently had, um, which was this term mixed exceptionalism. But I think there's always space to celebrate identity anyway. So I wanted to also highlight an amazing interview that I had recently for one of my participants in my PhD interviews. He was an Indian mixed heritage man. And when I asked him what it was like being educated in a predominantly white space, being a mixed race man, he told me, being mixed race is a, fundamentally, is a fundamental space of my thinking and identity. People have said it over and over again, but I don't think it's theorized well enough and I don't think it's written well enough. The more I think about it, the more I think of it's probably going to be the most important kind of theoretical space in terms of social identity as we move into the next few years. The simple idea of being in between, what does that mean? How does it live out? I think the positive of that is that you never feel like you fit anywhere, so it doesn't matter if you fit anywhere. It's okay to be a chameleon in that respect. The codes shift quite nicely when and if you need to. He said that being a mixed race educator allowed his students to open up to new ways of thinking about the world and how they saw each other. They were seeing someone that looked a bit like them. He talks about being able to relate to his racialized students. He says that there is a complexity to being mixed race that is massively ignored by everyone Every other advert has a set of mixed race families these days, but no one understands what that means and the prevalence of what that means in terms of cultural homogenization. He said it's a blessing. He described the house that he lived in as an anthropological experiment that's fundamentally beautiful and was a wonderful sign of progress. Um, and the last slide, please. So, because this is a storytelling and poetry event, I thought I'd end with some poetry. This is not my poetry because I am not talented. Although 
I'm going to start writing poetry later this evening um, because this poem is from the popular Netflix show Ginny and Georgia which really hones in on the idea of mixedness so if you haven't seen it um, there's a character called Ginny who is a black mixed heritage girl and she's trying to navigate herself within high school with people who don't understand her race and she doesn't really understand it herself um, and there's this poem that was called check one check other that I really liked so I'm just reading a couple of lines from it growing up I thought people were born with their heads cocked because of how they always looked at me boxes check one check other people don't know they don't burrow between the layers like I do they don't switch and twitch and actively make decisions of which which part of me belongs today I see both worlds so clearly and I skip and I jump and dance and fall between never seen. I belong in the spaces between. Check all that may apply. So thank you, everybody. We are speechless. Thanks very much, uh, Rihanna, for sharing that uh, really powerful uh, presentation. Um, I learned loads just, just listening and also engaging with you on, on Twitter and like other and your other socials as well about, and your blog as well um, about your experience as a as a mixed heritage person. Um, I think as well what you what you're saying about the experiences just generally in society that just for everyone that's listening, it's these things don't just happen like randomly in society that they're all historically contingent practices and just like discrimination. So like racism against Asian women in particular, uh, racialized and gendered. Um, if you look, if you took that back a few centuries, you then start looking at things around um, British colonization in parts of Asia where Asian women were also fetishized um, and, and exoticized by white men as well. Um, you can then also tie that back into the films and TV shows that get produced some in today as well. Um, one of the most recent I saw, problematic ones that I saw that did this was the, the Fantastic Beasts sequel. If any of you saw it, um, <clears throat> um, I think it was Fantastic Beasts, um, Crimes of Grindelwald, possibly, um, when the, uh, basically in the Harry Potter series, there's a snake called Nagini, who's like Dumbledore's um, Voldemort snake. In the, in the Fantastic Beasts films, the prequels, Nagini is what we'd call an, an animagus, so a, a human that can turn into um, um, an animal. And the snake is also depicted as a Korean woman. A human form is, is, a, is a Korean woman. And then, and then in the film is also fetishized by, by a white man in this sort of fantasy science fiction world, uh, very much in what Edward Said wrote about in his 1978 book, Orientalism, and um, how people who are from like the global south are, are othered by, by white people through art and culture and things like that. Um, but after hearing uh, Rihanna's talk, um, it brought me to also think about how even within sort of the mixed heritage label, in terms of discussions and media and, and, and so on, um, the, the Chinese experience is not something that is talked about as much as it, as it should be and could be. Um, in contrast to, say, the Black experience of mixed heritage identity, um, where even in the context of people that have one Black parent and, and one white parent on our TV screens and the films and so on. Um, the history of Chinese people and interracial unions in the 20th century, at the very least, is also one I came across when I was doing research on the 1919 uprisings um, and the White Terror campaigns that happened after the war. Uh, for example, even prior the First World War, there was a seamen's strike in Cardiff, in Wales, where Chinese workers were attacked by white men. Chinese men then fought in the war, um, who then came back to Britain, also settled in cities like Liverpool. Um, scholar activists like Yasmin Begum, who's based in Wales, have done a, a lot of work um, on the Cardiff uprisings, uh, particularly thinking about histories written by black and brown people that are also Welsh. Um, Yasmin represents a growing number of racially minoritized people in Wales, 
um, using their voices to, to also speak truth against power, against specific racist practices um, within Wales, which is very different to what's happening in the English context as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce the next apps. Um, is Gemma here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can see Yeah, Gemma's here. Um, the next app is Gemma Lise, who is a Romani, Gypsy and Polish um, disabled and neurodivergent artist, poet, actor and theatre maker from Bury in Lancashire. She is in receipt of an artist bursary from the Turnpike Galleries, a new exchange programme, and her piece um, created for a British art show nine, Where Have You Slept, is also on display at the gallery. Her first musical, Mind Your Business, has been shortlisted for the, for the Beam 2023. Um, and she is also a trainee journalist with the Travellers Times. And she is the in-house editor for Trails of Tales That Travel, the UK's only, uh, only totally gypsy Roman traveller run publishing company. Um, so tell everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi. Got my audio then. Um, so um, my heritage is um, on my dad's side. Um, we have been English gypsies um, for a very, very long time. Uh, Roma, who um, originally from northern India about a thousand years ago, uh, we, we left uh, the Punjab region. Um, on the other side, my uh, mum's dad was a Polish um, asylum seeker um, during the Second World War. He was interned by the Russians and forced to fight, and um, he eventually escaped to Britain, where he changed his name uh, from Ludwig Ostroska to Louis Carter, because Louis Carter could get a job, um, and Ludwig Ostroska couldn't. So um, this first one is called A Thousand Years and um, it's about how the um, one of the ministers of India um, recently proclaimed that Roma are children of India and um, we can travel freely uh, to India. So we are children of India, the minister proclaimed, as we set forth from the land of kings, the vast Punjabi plains, where we are attacked on that green earth, Mahmud of Ganzi forced the birth of Romani explorers under heaven's blue, their wheels hit dirt, adventuring to Byzantium. That came first, but Rome alone couldn't quench our thirst. Our stories unraveled as our caravans traveled to Anatolia and the Balkans made most of Europe our holy lands. 16 spokes turned as we spoke and learned our oral histories shared along the way. Some of us stopping, some couldn't stay from Rajasthan to God knows where, tried to extinguish our fire whilst we were there, made us feel like we should hide, traditions kept inside or modified, but in the end we somehow survived. And I am here with a thousand years. I wear like armour, aloft like a shield. Um, so this this next one is called lowercase white. Um, as I describe myself as lowercase white, I obviously have white privilege. I have white skin, um, but I'm not white British. Um, so and a lot of people sort of like to assume that I am um, and they get a bit offended uh, when they're corrected. I take it it's white British, your eyebrows rise when I say no, and a nurse straight up admonished me. Is that some kind of joke? Dissed me, dismissed my race, that bloke just didn't know. That a face like mine can mask a thousand year timeline from India to Anatolia, Balkans, Byzantine. To work us out what we're all about can be difficult to begin. Our story vast, our travel past, and about 50 endonyms. And I don't think for a minute that there's no advantage to my colour, but every time I'm open online, I'm accused of wanting to be other. And I understand why it goes hand in hand with passing, yet we've too been banned from shops and pubs like dogs and thugs. Privilege gains from my conception has the power to change the perception of a copper, a doorman. I see that that's a straw man. My eyes are open wide to the dark side of no home nation, of legislation, of jokes made in the wake of degradation, of costumes, of clothes, of appropriation to almost total annihilation. 
No traveller sounding names may stay here, they bark, and they've just pulled up on the kiddie park, so locals better lock your doors after dark. They break the law, they pay no tax, we need to get them off our backs. The girls are blessed, but just look how they're dressed. Let's poke fun of them on TV. That's when the scheme don't mean nothing for the GRT. They're white as ghosts, trying to explain it. You're the same, but different, they scoff. They don't even realise how to capitalise and crucially when to not. Um, this one, uh, I'm just going to give a content warning. Um, it is about the Roma and Sinti Holocaust. Um, a, a half a million uh, Roma and Sinti um, were uh, killed during the Second World War. Um, and anybody um, who married uh, Zaguna, uh, which is still used today as a derogatory term um, for gypsies, uh, was also um, deemed as being a race traitor. Um, and it's called Black Triangles because Black Triangles are what were put on the uh, uniforms of uh, Romani uh, people in um, Auschwitz. Black triangles. The new site given a green light has the locals up in arms. If you knew what they do then you'd see the harm. Littering, fly tipping and crime all rise whenever those lot arrive. Aggressively they come on in, expect us to take it on the chin. They're on the make, we feel unsafe. Devastation left in their wake, lock your windows and doors. It was so civilised before. Local wildlife's under threat, the schools are full, there's no room yet. They let them win again. Can't keep them out with rocks or ditch. They build new barriers with every pitch. To be accepted, they need to clean up their act. But us locals know they'd never do that. This all ain't new. This is what they do when Zaguna comes to town. Safety, health and morals all dragged down. An inferior race, get them out of this place, they're asocial and work shy. They can, can complete the construction of their own destruction. Arbeit, macht, fry. Tattooed arms and baby legs, hair shorn and made to beg for meagre rations, but uncle has sweets. He smiles and whistles whilst he selects his next set of scientific subjects. He sewed together back to back a young pair of Roma lads attempting to make conjoined twins. He injected infected and cut off limbs. Second class people made to lick mopped floors as the sea water torture took its course. Others covered in lice of typhus they died or Noma ate their faces away. Maybe they knew they'd be dead some day. The first night the SS tried, they barricaded, put up a fight. They smuggled out notes written in Romani, but the next time they bribed with bread and salami. Loaded on trains and marched in lines, exterminated with pesticides. They'd emptied the family camp this time. Not a single soul or trace left behind. Um. So the first part of that is actually things that I took off online articles about um, gypsies coming into people's towns. Um, and um, yeah, it might, fits really, really well with what um, the Nazis believed about us. Um, so I'm gonna finish off with um, a, a comedy uh, poem because that, that was very deep uh, and very, so this is um, about Mancunians um, and we are waterproof um, because uh, if you go into Manchester and it rains, nobody puts up brollies. Nobody in Manchester owns a brolly. We, we, we just don't bother. Um, so this is Mancunians are waterproof. If there's one universal truth, it's that Mancunians are waterproof. Lashings of weather, no brining, it'll be right. Never scrike a bitch, of it shining a shite. So clutching soggy prime arnie bags, singing in the rain, bubbling over drains, drenching us again. We ain't troubled, there's a spring in our step. Soon as it quits spitting, it's the best summer yet. Sat in a paddling pool, sipping cider with a brolly, BBQ burnt bangers, overpriced ice lolly. Basted buddies, sucking up the sunstroke. 
blanched bare beer bellies on every second bloke. No joke, the shot is seasons over all too soon, back to on the lash, splashing through a monsoon. But we ain't getting played by the cloak green racket. Us northern lasses can manage without a jacket. Bare legs and shoulders through sleet, showers and snow. Yeah, I got a big coat, but I left it at home. The kids lap sticks at battered horse chestnuts with chest puffed out, some kids satisfied strut. A corker of a champion swinging from his shoelace. He'll take on your crap gum, come here, any time, any place. When the snow starts sticking and it's starting to get nipper, skating to the chippy because the streets are getting slipper. The kid is scraping tops of every snowman and every car. It's a crappy grey snowman with flopper stick arms. The lecky bill's mental, but the lights are all dead merry, screaming out, fairy tale of a new York, when we've all had one too manner. But soon the slush and gutter shit makes their usual wool soup. It's storm time. But never mind, because Manx are waterproof. Cheers, everyone. Um, oh, just, just to let you know, uh, me doing this, um, this is, um, it, it's the deaf clap. It's uh, clapping in sign language. Uh, so it's really useful to do when you're on Zooms. Um, and another one is, uh, thank you as well. So if I do that at you, I'm not just being weird. It's, uh, it's BSL. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for that, Gemma. Um, I can see the chat just doing, num doing numbers as he was performing. Um, all those poems were, were amazing. Um, and as a as a historian as well, I, I found really the stuff about the Holocaust really useful and powerful. Because I think in in academia, there's a there's a culture that what 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 constitutes a source, and some academics will say that. Um, if you're not citing books or journal articles, then your, your source is not legitimate. But I think poems like yours could also be used as sources for people that are writing about um, um, gypsy Roman travellers and the Holocaust as one example. Um, and I think, yeah, I think poetry in general and creative writing um, needs to, be, there should be more pushes for creative writing to be used as, it, it, it can stand on its own next to journal articles, next to essays. Uh, and, and things like that. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, the next act is uh, Jade Matura. Is Jade here? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Um, Jade is a writer of British and Trona Zimbabwean descent, now based in Yorkshire. Uh, she writes novels, novels for young people with queer, multiracial and neurodiverse representations. Her poetry, short fiction, and non-fiction appears in various publications, which I've also linked in the Padlet document, and I'll post again in the chat. Um, in 2020, her story, um, Gribbler, won first prize in Nottingham Writers Studios short story competition, and appears in their Black Lives anthology. Um, Jade, anyone? Thank you. Thanks, Trey, and thank you, like everyone, for sharing your work. It's been really good. I love hearing the variety. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from a collection, a collection that I haven't written yet. It's a collection in progress, let's say. It's about. It's called Vadzimu, which is the word for um, in Shona. It's it's like it's the word for like ancestral. Uh, spirits i guess um um and their their job is sort of to protect you to protect their descendants and they're also quite vengeful if you don't if you don't do what if you if you displease them um so the the collection is going to explore um traditional like shona spiritual practice which is something i don't really know a lot about because my family are all christian my shona family are christian um and so this is about exploring that and it's links to the environment and nature um and it, you know it's something i feel was kind of kept from me so it's just me learning about that that's the process of this um so the first yeah the first poem i'm going to read it's called mwari mwari is like the word loosely translates as like god um so we use it to mean christian god but originally before christianity it was about um you know traditional notion of god the church he gifted us, but kept invisible, is hardened by time, brittle with age. 
I've searched for it in poems and stories, in vanishing slabs of chocolate enrobed, in royal eminence, in the crackle ignited at the junction of flesh, in the congregations at diagnoses, where I welcomed pharmacokinetic possession, in the descendants I gave blood to wrestle to life. At the brink of Circadian polar days, when auroral glare aches through my closed eyelids, I sometimes snatch unnerving glimpses of your temple on the horizon where you severed our name into fragments, scattered it into solar winds. One day I'll force open its rusted door to ask Mari why you kept them in disguise, scrambled the compass. Um, and this next one is called Passage Migrant. I wrote it on the way back from my uh, family home where I'd visited once again and regretted it and didn't feel welcome at all and just took my kids really early in the morning to a lake off the motorway, um, a very like fake uh, man-made sort of Milton Keynes-esque lake. <laughs> um, this is Passage Migrant. This land was so recently raised, the grid of roads labelled with numbers since the names were worn enough to retire to landfill. Here are the desolate wastelands of a future we were taught to dread, a desperate recreation of home under a flimsy perspex dome too transparent to obscure the rotting reality we hold inside rib cages and ignore. Among the manicured woodland, there's open space to run, but the breeze struggles to stir M1 fumes. Unable to dance with Lancaster stories, we tread the tracks of bulldozers instead of ancient families' footsteps. We squint, unblinking at the lab grown lake shadows. Without apple pay for hourly entry, no plesia saw ghost ever darkens its depths. The most real things are the geese that bob around the half in feigned belonging, avoiding one another's gaze, knowing this wasn't meant for them, but returning each year, beholden to a vague notion that they always did. Until danger fastens its jaws on them, it's the only place they have. When the edges of green scorch to black, hissing as they curl away, when snapping teeth have yanked out their tail feathers, when the lake starts to bubble, they'll perch at the edge of the shore and try to hide their panting, shift position once more and again, burning through discomfort with faces as empty and placid as softening, melting tarmac. Um, I'm going to read, could I, um, Trey, would you share the ivory bangle lady, please, for us? Um, so uh, the Ivory Bangle Lady is a skeleton. I'm, I'm in York. Um, in 1901, they dug up the uh, Ivory, Bang Ivory Bangle Lady's skeleton. Um, her burial site was set out um, with lots of jewels and riches. Um, she, she was a very wealthy, important Roman woman. Um, that was 1901. And then in 2010, they did the uh, analysis of her bones and teeth and stuff and decided that she was probably of mixed heritage probably of uh, african and european heritage um so this this poem is um i can't remember contrapuntal sonnets um i've done it's basically yeah, it's a it's two separate poems that can be read in different ways so i'll probably read it a couple of times just so we can get an idea of how it goes okay undisturbed my roman bones preserved beneath the ground before builders had their work postponed because of what they found riches adorned my afterlife bed since fourth century a.d a christian plaque whitby jet bangles of elephant ivory scrubbed as pure as it could get my skeleton entombed in glass some stones still unturned yet buried way back in the past a hundred and nine years more I lay in rest while awaiting my osteological tests. If only they could speak. My stories released, I saw the light. I worshipped in the dark. For my name exposed for all to see the truth. If my dreams were jewels, they'd tell you who I really was, beyond the confines of womanhood. I learned to ride, one leg each side of a horse. I harnessed muscles and adventure before stirrups to brace urging motion against spurred a soldier's steed 50 miles to my prize, the perfect contrast against slate skies and waves of billowing smoke, a glistening beach of black jet. My pummeled thighs were thunderclouds from the weight I hauled home. My ivory trophy was of value to me, but it's interesting that for a century it's the only asset you'll see. 
Um, and I'm just going to read it quickly one more time because I think about time. Um, in a kind of there's all kinds of different ways you could read it, I think, but I'm just going to do a couple more. Undisturbed, my Roman bones preserved beneath the ground, if only they could speak. Before builders had the work postponed, my stories released because of what they found. I saw the light. Riches adorned my afterlife bed. I worshipped, since 4th century AD, in the dark, a Christian plaque, Whitby Jet, bangles of elephant ivory for my name. Scrubbed pure as it could get, my skeleton entombed in glass, exposed for all to see. Some stones still unturned yet, the truth buried way back in the past. 109 years more I lay in rest while awaiting my osteological tests. If my dreams were jewels, if only they could speak, they'd tell you who I really was. My stories released beyond the confines of womanhood. I saw the light, I learned to ride one leg each side of a horse. I harnessed muscles and I worshipped adventure. Before stirrups to brace urging motion against in the dark, I spurred a soldier steed fifty miles to my prize, the perfect contrast for my name. Against late skies and waves of billowing smoke, a glistening beach, a black jet, exposed for all to see. My pommel thighs were thunderclouds from the weight, the truth I hold home. My ivory trophy was of value to me, but it's interesting that for a century, that's the only asset you'll see. Um, I forgot time for one more or not. Oh. Yeah, I think if it's a short one. Um, cool, I'll just do a quick, yeah, I'll just read, I'll just read a quick one. You don't want the um, second page actually on this as well? Um, the second page is just a footnote about who she is. Skeleton, okay. Roman skeleton. Don't, yeah, don't worry. Don't, okay. that's cool. Thank you. Uh, this one is called Severed Pride. I'll just read it really quickly. Um, I used to work somewhere. It's about a place where I used to work. Um, I used to have long, like, locks. Um, so this is kind of half a true story. Where I used to work, there were lions. It was a zoo um, theme park and there were lions. That's the backdrop. Somewhere there's a piece of me that was stolen by a man whose name I can't remember, though his half kind, half sinister, half smile is unforgettable. While I pressed against enclosure glass at the rung out zoo where we worked, within Kamali, king of the shabby lions, to recognise me, he helped himself, sleight of hand, severing a lock using a knife he pulled from his uniform jacket. I only felt it fall away as I watched him place it in his ch chest pocket close to his heart. I don't know what he did with it. Perhaps it's still there, forgotten. Maybe his resident vagina shook it out of the pockets of his work uniform while she sorted the laundry and recoiled in repulsion from the matted piece of my crown, half a gorgon serpent. Perhaps he waited until he was alone to examine the hor horrifying specimen under a bright light and make notes of his findings on its construction. Maybe he allowed his kid to put it in the perspex viewer from his creepy crawly, crawly explorer kit alongside half an earthworm that didn't survive the trough. Perhaps he waited for a new moon and lit a candle in the chat room he visited every night for 33 weeks and proudly offered it to his appraising brethren, brethren before awaiting instructions for the second half of the plan. I don't know why he did it. He said it didn't matter because it didn't belong to me, really, because hair this texture this long could only be shot bought. But I wondered if I'd have survived if I'd sliced his shop bought spectacle, spectacles or his shop bought car or his shop bought Bible in the whispered roar of an employee at the bottom of the most feral food chain. I told him that my mane was as real as Kamali's and as tired as we and the pride behind their glass and brick were, Kamali's cold eyes sparkled at me and my morning litter pick, our unique acknowledgement, both Yorkshire nod and black nod, silent agreement that we'd know the exact moment we or our descendants will be ready to pounce, tear rib cages apart and take back what's ours, still beating and slick with life. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, um, Jade. Um, we're about We've got four acts left uh, tonight. Does any do do people want a break? About ten minutes, five minutes or so, or do people want to go sh straight through? No, then you. Okay, I'm going to just assume that uh, people just want to go straight through. 
Um, the next act is uh, Rebecca um, Chiang, uh, Judge. Um, who is of mixed Hong Kong, Chinese and white British heritage. She works part-time as a doctor in intensive care and part-time on community-based health, health projects. Um, seeking to improve access to and experience healthcare for, imagined, for marginalized communities. Uh, she is a coordinating member of Med Act Race and Health Justice Group. Um, I think this is Rebecca's first time reading poetry um, to an audience as well. Um, so, um, so everyone just be be kind and make comments. I just give um, Rebecca positive energy. Um, it's her first time doing poetry to an audience like this. So yeah, um, Rebecca, everyone. Hello, thanks so much, Joe. Um, as Joe said, my name is Rebecca, and it's a real privilege to be in this space with you all. Um, this is, as you said, that my first time sharing something I've written publicly, so I'm a newbie at this, and this writing is newly formed and unfinished. Um, but I feel very grateful to share and to be seen, and I hope in letting you see me, something in you also feels seen. Um, my mum, Mayan, was Hong Kong Chinese, and she died of COVID last year. I share these writings with you about my relationship with her and my mixed heritage, as well as the personal and collective pains that are symptomatic of structural and interpersonal violence. In doing so, I will speak about the process of dying, grief, PTSD and racism, as well as also touching on sexual violence. So if these themes are raw for you, I invite you to take the space away that you need. This writing is called Dying Birthing. In your dying, I knew that more than all of you was dying, for some of all of me was dying in your dying. In your dying, I longed to be able to comfort you with Cantonese lullabies, your body broken anew like a newborn child's, fragile, unfamiliar, dependent, nearing the end as I neared a beginning. In your dying, the only words my mouth could form were, Aya, Mama, don't die like this. Aya, Mama, don't leave me like this. My warm cheek pressed against your ever cooling chest, my aching body resonating with each of your drifting heartbeats. In your dying, all I can hear is your heartbeat. Lub dub, lub dub, one, two, three, four. Yuck ye, some say, yuck ye, some stop. You go still and my cheek turns cold. I go still with nothing left to resonate with. Aya, mama, don't leave me like this. Aya, mama, don't birth me like this. In your dying, I am rebirthed and like a newborn severed unwillingly from its source, expelled resistantly from the womb, I scream in post protest. Hungry for air, but unable to catch it, dying to breathe, but instead forced to live on breathlessly without you. In your dying, I scream a silent scream, for whiteness has told me we must be quiet, polite and pleasing to it. So I turn down my screams and turn up a smile, fold your underwear into a crumpled plastic bag, press my lips to your forehead one last time and thank everyone for their help, their help in your dying like the good woman I was told I should be. In the wake of your dying, my heart strikes against me from within me, yielding a force which feels as if its sole intent is to break me. Lub dub, lub dub, one, two, three, four, yuck ye, some say, yuck ye, some say, yuck ye, some say, why won't it stop? In the wake of your dying, I have nightmares. Nightmares that wake me from sleep, but yet I can't wake up from. Nightmares of white men exerting their power over you as they decide if you live or if you die, as they sacrifice your life for their gain, as they break your body with their pride, all the while silencing us with a, be grateful for what we've done for you. I let out a scream and wonder why no one can hear it. In the wake of your dying, I have nightmares. Nightmares that wake me from sleep, but yet I can't wake up from. Nightmares of white men exerting their bodies over me as they decide I am a fetish that needs satisfaction through submission, as they trade my pain for their pleasure, as they break my body with their pride. 
all the while whispering in my ear, be grateful for the attention. I let out a scream and wonder why no one can hear it. In the wake of your dying, I have nightmares, nightmares that wake me from sleep, but yet I can't wake up from. I wonder why these nightmares of your life and my life are all tangled up. Why my pain and your pain become a disorientating abyss. It's atypical to be traumatized by a threat that isn't to your own life, a psychiatrist in a bow tie says to me from across the room. And I wonder if I should bother to explain what intergenerational or collective pain is to him, how a threat to your kin can feel as if it's a threat to your skin. In the wake of your dying, pain and pleasure become indistinguishable. Agony and euphoria are sharp blur. Reality and surreality are lucid dream. The rational absurd and the absurd rational. Nothing real and yet everything all too real. Numb then raw, raw then thaw. Yut ye sam say, say sam ye yut. Can I count down the beats left until the beating stops? In the wake of your dying, I am forced to learn to breathe in you. In, out, in, in, out, out, in, out. My breath disynchronous as my lungs learn the unfamiliarity of your absence. My limbs contorted as my muscles are held in tension with no counter tension. My chest aching and pounding as my body fights in protest of losing you. So I learn to breathe to silence the screams in my body. I learn to live on because you did not die for me to die too. In the wake of your dying, I hear a child cry, Aya, 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 Mama. And I think of how we learn to cry from our mothers, learn to cry in the mother tongue of our mothers, crying a kind of mother tongue, a language that we learn to speak with our mothers and that we return to when we are in need of our mothers. And I think, what are we to do when they are no longer there to echo our cries? no longer there to decipher our screams in mother tongue, no longer there to soothe us with their mother tongue. Aya, mama, why did you have to die like that? Aya, mama, why did you have to birth me like that? In the swell of my living, I find myself walking the streets of Hong Kong, strangely familiar and yet familiarly strange my body learning a new ease that is unfamiliar to me as it metabolizes an unease that is so familiar to me. In the swell of my living, I smile at a stranger and she embraces me, pressing a bow into my hand, saying, hacker food for you. And I find my face warmed by tears. Later, I learn that the word for my mother's people, haka, means guest, the guest people and something unseen in me is unexpectedly seen, a guest in every space I visit. In the swell of my living, I return to London, the place I call home, and in the embrace of family and chosen family, we share our threads of home. Steamed dim sum, fried plantain and jollof rice, different histories, memories and forgotten stories, different weapons, malignancies and fatalities, different violences, silences, and cries for what has been, differing threats, differing privileges, and differing protections from the powers that be. But yet, shared pains of unbelonging, shared pains for our mothers, shared pains for our mothers' mothers. And as we spill our pains, the weight of our pains are split across our tender hearts. And in the tenderness, we find new strength to metabolize our pain. In the swell of our living, we, the guests, weave our threads of home into a rich fabric of love and interdependence, which holds us as we break and is the ground on which we heal. And we say together, in the unbelonging, we find belonging. And we say together, in the depths of our grief, we grieve together. And we say together, in our living, we put to death our dying. And I say to you, Mama, Aya, Mama, we love you like this. Aya, Mama, we live on like this. Thank you.
Thanks, Rebecca. Um, that was deeply moving, and I'm sure that the chat is just is going to do numbers as well. And for your first time I'm reading, um, it was amazing, honestly. Um, and I think you should, if, if you if you're interested as well, I think you should definitely pursue the poetry circuit with with, with your work. Um, but yeah, thanks for, thanks very much for sh for sharing that. Um, the next act is Lucas. Is Lucas here? Hello. Yes. Hello. Um, so prior to this event, um, so the next act is Lucas Fothergill. So prior to this event, myself and Lucas had uh, had a discussion, and I left that chat really fascinated uh, by um, this person's work and also generally like his, his background as well. So um, he's writing a book called Everyone. Everyone Everywhere, Mixed Race Family Stories, with un, which has been published with Unbound Publishing. It was currently only partially funded, that's correct, Lucas. And it, it still, it needs help getting distribution. So um, I've put the link in the Padlet document to the, to the Unbound site as well. So if anyone wants to contribute and to help this book get published, um, that'd be really amazing. So as a historian, I was also completely um, taken with also um, his stories of his family history, uh, particularly on um, his dad's side in, of Fothergill's um, based in Sheffield, and how he told me his, his father had this sort of working class pride, that's correct, Lucas, um, doing the research. Um, and I just found it really brutal to listen to, especially in this day and age where um, we're living in a UK that's full of um, turmoil and the the ongoing cultural um, and also even like left-wing politics has been stigmatized as well um, in the media and, and in the press and so on. Um, Lucas is a British Sri Lankan uh, with almost a decade of storytelling experience across documentaries, podcasts um, and print journalism. Lucas adores true stories that tell us something larger about ourselves. He has developed and helped produce documentaries on race, uh, politics and crime. Um, for Netflix, the BBC, Channel 4, Channel 5, and helped produce podcasts for Vice and has published journalism in the independent Vice and Enemy magazine. Uh, prior to working full time, he studied English literature with creative writing at Newcastle University. And today he lives in London. Um, so, Lucas, everyone. Uh, hello, and uh, thanks so much, Trey, for that introduction. Um, and to everyone for for speaking today as well. It's been like amazing to to hear you all. Um, I'm not actually I, like um, as Trey's mentioned. I'm not here today as a poet. I'm here today to talk a little bit about the book, if that's okay. And I just wanted to start by just telling you a little bit the story. It's not actually the story that sort of Trey sort of alluded there to about um, sort of my own family, uh, really. But I'll just get going. And thanks so much again for everyone for your time today. Uh, I'm a little nervous because I've never spoken publicly about it before, but I'm going to do my best. Um, for me, the story with the book starts where most stories do not, which is the Watford branch of the nightclub Oceana. It's 2013, I'm a teenager, I'm in the disco room, my knees are creaking as I dance to One Direction. Records are being spun by aggressively middle-aged DJs wearing Hollister polos, rainbow lights hammering down onto the floor from above, and a moat of sticky carpet is surrounding us on all sides. Jaeger bombs are missing their targets, sliding down cheeks and chins, and a scent of flatulence floods overhead. Welcome to Oceana, welcome to Watford. I'm dancing with my new-ish friend, Albert. That's not his real name, as Albert was born in the 90s, a decade best known as a dry patch for Albert births. Everywhere Albert went, rivers of booze and clouds of wee smoke emitted from burrito-sized blunts followed, and to me, Albert was like a character from a stoner comedy. Back in the club, my cousin is over there, I said to Albert in a fit of enthusiasm. Let's go see him. Albert and I slithered through a herd of people up towards Liam. Liam is Sri Lankan, he's an Asian. Um, and I say to Liam, Liam, meet Albert, I said. And Albert, meet my cousin Liam. And there's a pause. And Albert goes, he's your cousin. I said, yeah. My expression is as stony as a wall. And I quickly noticed the confusion washing over Albert's face. And I sort of just want to fill him in. I say, like, oh, my dad's white, English, and my mum's Sri Lankan. He goes, oh, Albert says, the blank sort of filling in. He goes, I thought you were Egyptian. 
And Albert and I had never actually discussed my family before. Um, as, as mentioned, he's a newish friend. He had just sort of seen me and not, we've not discussed anything. And he sort of just done the maths in his head and just decided that I was Egyptian and just sort of gone on with the rest of his life and never said anything. And in the club where he said this to Liam, I, my lovely Liam laughed and then went on to tell as many of my family, I grew up around all of my Sri Lankan family. He told as many of my um, Sri Lankan family as possible. Uh, and they loved that as someone thought I was Egyptian at the time and they sort of laughed along with him. They thought it was funny. And I guess I sort of laughed along with them at the time as well. But as sort of time went on, I started feeling a little sort of strange about this moment and it's here that I realized that I knew very little at this point in my life about being mixed or about wider mixed history or about much at all um, and I was sort of a teenager sort of wondering what there was out there to learn um, about mixed history or is there a mixed culture to, that you can point to and I wanted to find out more and that's why over the past decade I've been reading and listening and watching as much as possible I know that Trey mentioned Shabian and Peter Smull's um, book about mixed race 20th century so I recommend that to anyone to read it that wants to learn more but I wanted to learn more and as I sort of listened to all these podcasts and watched documentaries and read all these books I felt that um, stories about mixed people tended to always focus on tough experiences and I think that's fine and um, if that's the truth of someone's experience and that's the truth of my experience sometimes too but I think there's another side to it that maybe isn't always written about as much and I think that's moments of triumph and love and joy and that's the kind of story that I wanted to write about and interview people about and try and put out there in the world in a book and share and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today um, so the book, like I said, is about every, it's called Everyone Everywhere, um, and it's about the past 100 years of mixed experiences and history told through what I hope will be <laughs> compelling interviews with mixed people of all ages and backgrounds from every part of the UK and all different kinds of mixes as well. So I'm really excited to discuss it. Um, and I hope there's three aims. I'm going to finish up where I'm soon. I, won't, I don't want to drain on too much, but there's three aimed with the book. First of all, it's to share stories about the mixed experience, which while full of challenges are always joyous and full of love and fun too. That's a key thing. Second, I want to interview, but I have, uh, I'm reading something that's old now. I have interviewed a wide range of um, people of all ages across the UK to show how the mixed experience itself has changed. So I want to have number one, compelling stories about people that I hope people will really enjoy. Number two, I want it to show how the mixed experience has changed over time because those people are talking about different time periods. And I'm hoping that in the same process, you can show how Britain as a country has changed and hopefully how it will continue to change in certain ways. Um, and the people I've interviewed have been so delighted to share the stories. It's been like a real privilege to speak with them and sort of to write about them. And I'm so excited to share them and put it out into the world. Um, yeah, again, it's called um, Everyone Everywhere. And just like um, Trey said, it's a bit of a weird thing. So Unbound are the publisher and Unbound have a different way of doing things. You might have heard of Unbound because they published The Good Immigrant, um, which is an amazing book that Nikesh Shukla did um, a few years ago. And I'm sure many people on this call have read that and Unbound did that. But the Unbound are a little different is that because they have a sort of crowdfunding element to their books. So essentially, if you get a certain amount of pre-orders on the book, then they all then kick into gear, create a hardback book and it will go into shops. So that's what I'm sort of hoping that um, people on this call, if you think that it's something that might be of interest, I'm going to tell you a little bit more now about who's in the book and what the stories are, but I'm just hoping that if people on this call are, are interested in learning more and hearing these stories, then um, you just give the link a click and see if it's something that you might be interested in, in buying. The ebook should be £10. Um, like for the book, I've like borrowed into the National Archives for deeper research. And as I said, I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people. There's one person who's a GI baby who, in a rare case, was lucky enough to have their American father stay with the family in rural South Wales after the war. And that's an incredible story about love and jazz clubs. And in another chapter, I watched in real time as another GI baby got in touch with their paternal family for the first time and that was really beautiful i've also spoken with the first ever mixed chef in the uk to get michelin star who did so after surviving a car accident where they actually lost their strongest hand and they still got that michelin star with just one hand and that's a really amazing story um as well and they're sort of just people that i've sort of found through my research and things like that but i'm also speaking to people with what you might or higher profiles, if you want to call them that, 
such as the, the actor uh, Zowie Ashton, talking to her about being a child star and the effect that has on you. Um, I've spoken with the rapper Loyal Kana about reconnecting with his family. I've spoken with the footballer Anton Ferdinand about his experiences, about the TV presenter Mikita Oliver, about sort of discovering all sorts of new things about both sides of her family and sort of later life and about her career. Um, and there's many, many more that I don't want to uh, mention right now, but I'm really, really excited about this. And I really hope that other people might be too. And again, like the, the, um, it won't happen without other people's support. We're almost like halfway, effectively, if like um, a couple hundred more people pre-order it over this year, then it's going to happen. So that's why I was really excited today to sort of speak about it. And um, that's just flown by. I, I don't know about you, it's <laughs> flown by for me, but uh, I was a bit nervous and I hope it wasn't boring for you. And again, Zay, thank you so much, uh, Trey, for organising this. And thank you to everyone who's listening. And if you're interested, please uh, give that li um, link a click and see if it's something you might be interested in. And please tell anyone you know who might be interested. And yeah, thank you so much again. Thanks, Lucas. Um, I've posted the links in the chat as well for anyone who wants, that wants to see more information about the book. Um, so um, I'm going to go on to the next act. Uh, the next act is um, Celeste. Celeste here. Hello. Hi. Um, so Celeste Charles is Northampton-based singer-songwriter by trade and goes by the stage name, um, Afrini, and she has made Mark as being a versatile singer-songwriter, um, as well as doing so in the face of being underestimated by other people as well. Um, she moved to Northampton with her family to escape um, domestic violence, and then also a religious organization that took her youth and teenage years traveling the country and Europe, working and performing. Um, Afrini became a mother at 20 years old and fought to prove many people wrong, um, also dealing with postnatal depression while gaining a university degree and writing songs in her tiny flat. Now, Afrini writes deeply from the experiences of her childhood, heartbreak and the natural drama that comes from a small town music scene. And I can, I can agree with that. I can, I can agree with that um, because Celeste and I both live in the same town and have been subject to the same small town, small mindedness of local arts organisations. Um, mm -hmm. And that's totally true. She is a voice representing queer, um, but also global majority and single parent communities, and is known for a soulful yet delicate voice. Um, a freely, everyone. Hello. Oh, thanks, Trey. I'm so nervous. <laughs> <Come on, breathe. laughs> um, Okay, um, I just want to say, first of all, this has been like, I feel like a life changing experience. I didn't realise um, that in doing this, I, there's a lot of issues that I haven't dealt with. <laughs> so as I was writing, um, I haven't written poetry for years. I think the last time I wrote any sort of poetry, I was probably about 15. Um, and, but I do write songs. And so I kind of... Um, thought oh it would be you know similar sort of process and I've written in the same way I write songs which is very um just another form of, of therapy um and yeah so just please bear with me I'm, I'm absolutely terrible. I'm off my belly I'm, fine. Um, I'm, fine. I'm so nervous so um, I've just got four short short poems um that I wrote and like I said I realized as I was writing that there's a lot of um topics in being mixed race that I think I haven't myself and my sister we speak about this that I've just not sort of dealt with and issues that haven't been sort of dealt with properly which I'm gonna explore <laughs> after this um so I'm just gonna go through through these oh, god <laughs> uh, where's the first one I'm getting all flustered just bear with me I was freezing cold a minute ago Right. This one is actually, um, I think it was Rihanna who was using quotes that she'd been told, I think, um, in, 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 in her work. And that's what I base this on, um, things that my white boyfriends have told me <laughs> in the past. Um, it's okay 
with you because you're the white kind of black, like a coconut or a bounty. I swear to God, I heard the white kind of black and yet I giggled and nodded. He was the first guy to notice me and not ask if I'll sing Beyonce at this open mic. So I guess he's okay. It's just cool seeing you with your kind of people. I had just come back from a Lauren Hill concert. I told myself it was just the way he worded it that sounded bad, but I couldn't quite figure out which way would have been better. You're more white than black though, aren't you? Do I say I'm not black? No, I can't say that because that makes saying that I'm not black like a bad thing. I should say I'm just mixed race. No, but then that sounds weird and no one says that. Um, I'll say I am black, but no, I can't say that because I'm, I'm told I'm not. And he wouldn't be with me if I was. Wait, that, no, that's not true, is it? I don't know. I, I just nodded and laughed. My brother was surprised we got together. He didn't think I'd like black girls. There is no response to this. There is no words to say. Certainly not thank you, but I don't want to argue and I'm just going to stay quiet. Can't you just twerk at the back? No, I definitely can't do that. You wouldn't like this. It's not your kind of music. You wouldn't understand the real struggles of a black woman. You wouldn't know. You don't know. I don't know, but I know I'm not a fetish that's just black enough to satisfy your father's insistence that he can say the N-word. I don't know, but I know my daughter's future struggle as she grows into a black woman and that as she looks at herself and me and sees the differences in her skin and in our skin and hair. I don't know, but I know I'm not defined by my Spotify playlist from Paramore to Bitty McLean, whether I'm singing Kings of Leon or Whitney Houston. I don't know, but I know your defense of being a racist man is always, well, I dated Celeste. I don't know, but I know that I am not your excuse. That's the first one. Uh, da -da -da -da. I'm shaking. Um, this one is um, very much uh, just kind of visualizing myself as a 14 year old girl. Um, in school uh, and I really struggled. Um, just a bit of background, my dad, I didn't even say anything. My dad is black, he is from Grenada um, and my mum is white from the UK. Um, and um, yeah, my, my dad has, wasn't, has always been around but he's never been great. And so my mum, you know, was predominantly raising us and I very disconnected from my Caribbean side of my family. Um, the sizzling 1499 straightening iron was at 230 degrees Celsius. The curls were still damp as she raced to get more serum. See, mum, she yelled, picking the irons up and ignoring the faint burn on the carpet, or the steam making her face sweat, or the crackling sound, that crackling sound and the stinging roots. We're late but she can't go because the waves are still there and it's messy and angry and frizzy and ugly and big and boisterous and hurry up. Her fingers were sore, but Tim Timothy Yildren had said that only the pretty girls in class had straight hair and Jessica had a tan, but it was the right kind of, I've just come back off holiday tan. So she had stolen her mum's face powder. And even though she was sure it did look a little bit odd, she looked like she did in winter. And that was when Emma B slammed their arms together and said that they were almost the same shade. So she dusted some more on and huffed as it clung to her still damp serum soaked hair. She had asked for braids, but they had just slipped out in her sleep. And Anaya said they looked silly because her hair wasn't right. And even though Anaya was the only girl in class with a deep skin tone, it glowed so much unlike her patchy cheeks. And she had braids long down to her back with beads on. And we are leaving. She unplugged the iron and glanced at her patchy face. She wasn't happy. Her mama said her hair looked nice, but it wasn't, and it was hot. And the hair at the base of her neck was already prickling and curling around her forehead and her skin was itchy and now her eyes were brimming over and she just wanted to look nice and normal, like Anaya or Jessica or even Emma B. But she wasn't like any of them. She wasn't anyone, but she'll learn. That's that one. The cat's come in to say hello. Hello. Um, 
Right, where is it? Um, uh, this one is, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, probably around 2014, um, when hashtag Team Light Skin was just a thing on Twitter. Um, and <laughs> this, we could just spend all evening talking about the problems of that. Um, and I remember uh, my sister and her friends would do it and it wasn't even, in, they, they were too young, I think, to realize the problems of it. And so, so was I at the time. Um, uh, but I remember something about that really stood out to me. Um, so that's based on this. Team Light Skin, the hashtag said it, so I don't get to choose. Not like football or netball, not like friends, more like family. There's no choice in the matter. Jumping headfirst into a humorous meme, light skin girls be like, they be human, they be lost or lonely, they'll be jealous, they be confused, they be having a lack of identity in a world dripping in labels created for what purpose? Like every man-made joke in relation to skin color, it was made to separate and segregate, this time from within. A different variation on the angry black woman. Light-skinned girls full of arrogance and bitchiness. It's the, she thinks she's better than you and the, she's stuck up, sure, but in the same way every human being has the ability to pick your team, team light skin. Does it work on a percentage? Is it just 50 50 or does it work on a scale? On Twitter, it was met with no team dark skin. And then someone said, Do you mean team house slave or field slave? Because in our history, that's all it came, comes down to. It doesn't matter. You were all separated. And that's a conversation that even I'm not healed enough to approach, but I'm, I'm certainly not team light skin. Um, and I'm just going to read my last one now. I don't know about time because I have no concept of time. You can't sit on me. Oh, my cat's sent, spent all of this time sitting <laughs> outside. Um, this one is called Aki and Saltfish. And this was the one that I kind of started to feel very like, oh, I've got some, some things to work on. Um, I grew up in a very strict... Um, religious sort of culty like environment and um I think I can't remember who is it Jade uh and uh, I who said is it, I don't want to get the wrong person but I grew up with a lot of Zimbabwean families and um I adopted more of that culture than my own Caribbean culture um so this is my last one thank you guys so much um I lie and tell people I like Aki and Saltfish I lied once because I was embarrassed that I didn't I pretend to know Patois better than I do. I get overly defensive over the pronunciation of plantain, as if that's a personality trait of Caribbeans. My grandfather was cruel and violent and my grandmother left her sons with him and ran to Grenada, setting off a family chain of abuse. That's all I know. I know it's a spice island. I say it proudly when my grandparent in-laws say they've holidayed there. I talk as if I know what it's like. Oh, Grenada, the Spice Island is beautiful. I don't. I don't know my culture. I know British culture, the same culture that brings me much of my sleepless nights. I make jokes about queuing and politeness. I don't know my culture. To find it, I have to relive the trauma of that side and I don't like it. I was hanging out with Zimbabwean families in my teens and I know more African recipes and language and culture than I do my own. I went to Nigeria and gave my quarter Grenadian, quarter English, half Zimbabwean daughter a Nigerian name because that was something I'd experienced. And I don't know my culture. I'm scared of my history because I have to step past my parents and grandparents that made a line of children so broken that I'd rather just, I'd rather just lie and say, I like Aki and Saltfish. And that's all done. Thank you guys so much. I'm <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Afriani, you were awesome. And I think you should be so proud of your yeah, work. That, that was fantastic. Yeah. That was that was amazing. That was food for the soul. Mm. I'll also um thank you. I'll also acknowledge that I I, I can't stop this either. <laughs> 
and it gives me it, people give me grief over it, but I don't like it, and I've never liked it ever. Um, and I say plantain, not plantain. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for that, Celeste. Yeah. That was that was really amazing. Um, we're down to the, the last act of tonight. Um, who is uh, Syra Ibrahim? Um, so Syra Ibrahim is trying to find the bio. Um, you don't need to read it all out, Trey. <laughs> um, Syra was born in uh, Balochistan, Pakistan. Have I said? Have I said that? Right. Nearly. Baluchistan. Baluchistan. Yeah. Okay. Baluchistan, Pakistan, and has lived in the UK since she was eight years old. Her career has been in further education as a lecturer, curriculum manager, and also a cross-college senior role as quality improvement manager. She took a career break to have, um, to have three children and went back into education and became a primary school teacher. In 2018, she had she um, received a diagnosis of GPA vasculitis, and this has brought a different focus to her life, opening it up to a new exciting phase of potential. Um, I'm going to leave the bio there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Syrah's the last act of tonight, everyone. So um, give a hand for Syrah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Trey, thank you for this evening. It's amazing what you've done to platform us with our voices. And it's it's so nice that we've got experienced people on here and then newbies like me. I've never I've never spoken my poems out anywhere, yet I've written them all my life. You, know. you can tell my voice is a bit nervous. Hopefully I'll calm. Everybody's been amazing. I'm just in awe. Uh, my first poem I will just very briefly explain, it's just about, a bit more about my heritage. Uh, my father's side um, is from Balochistan, and um, that's a region in Pakistan. My ancestors from there go right back centuries ago to like the Iraq, Syria, um, Turkish border, and uh, migrated through Iran then into Balochistan. I lived there till I was eight, and my mother's side is English, um, the whole family really from Lancashire um, and this poem really just encapsulates all of that. Ancestors. Coursing through my veins runs the blood from your rage, from an age where you stood on the rocks of Bashiltan, looking across back over the mountain ridges to the plateaus beyond and felt the dry air layer dust after dust layer across the bodies of those they butchered, the same bodies we loved, the ones we bickered with, laughed and scolded, shared our food and our heart-filled minds with, their blood now dried under more rock. 1935, and our world is now shaken, level 7.7 .7 on the Richter, but a battered, scarred table saved our neck, and into this world you came screaming a healthy, lung-filled baby boy child. And now that you've passed, this land has turned from dust to droplets, to flow, to ripples, from the swirls of the currents to the tremendous rapids washing us all away. From the left to the right, on the other hand, along the tipping scale of balances, to the butchers spruced in Sunday best, polished shoes for respectful address, few bright pennies clasped in hand, Fat sausages borrowed for another day, a crystal sugar bowl to pave the way, to formal gardens and a country estate where green fingered labour and a drunk in a cellar led to the biggest manhunt this side of last century, this side of the moors of Manchester, near to where Betsy Shipperbottom once tipped her crown, to the castle top town that lent its passage to the land of seven hills, where the blades turn a red and white sharpened edge to carve out my soul of steel. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, just, I'll just 
let you know, Betsy Shipperbottom was my grandfather's mother. And in our family, we just love her name. So uh, I always had to get that in there. This poem's called Veracity. Veracity, be, veracity means to confirm. This world was not made for the likes of you and I. We have a place and we have a name, but in terms of destiny of habitude, there can be no rest. I would rather peel onions and let the knife curse its cuts through my palms than shed the tears I held for us. When there was indeed no we. We have danced a dalliance through our years, our interthreaded lives pulling against each other, tight and fraught, angry words, raised voices, tired eyes that are always averted, rarely slackened and only resting when time allows us favour, a breathing space for night and day to pass within each lunar cycle, from full moon to crescent to the darkness that descends from a heaven of hopeless stars. I would rather the tales that feed my mind carve their character from my heart than blunt my hope with perfidious predilection. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Brilliant, lovely. Oh, thank you. Um, the next um, couple of poems, um, I'm not going to explain them. It's just, I identify as mixed heritage. Um, like Red Medusa was saying earlier, I'm not keen on the mixed race thing at all. And also, sometimes our heritages, and it's been very clear this evening how people have spoken, are incredibly complicated and we do not fit in any box or certainly we're not an asterisk at all are we so um the next few poems are about whether or not we actually have a space are we allowed a space who determines who we are does anybody even bother to ask us who we are um this poem is called burden however it's not the burden that I feel I carry. Burden. What is it that we know, really know? We rise at the break of day. We fall at the close of night. We blanket ourselves with layers and layers of superficial outerwears, the ones that clothe us and cloak us, the ones that split the threads of who we are. Our titles, our roles, our speeches, our voices, our mimicries, our outrages, our nurtured alliances. And finally, our silences. Our burden is more from the quiet of what is not said than the weight of the prose we carry. What is it that we feel, really feel? This poem's called, Where Are My People? I ask myself, where are my people? We talk, we laugh, we share, we share intimacy, honoring friendship, intimacy that means something. But ultimately, I stand alone. Within these spaces, I always stand alone. And I can tell you why, and I can tell you when. It's when my light shines too bright. I always thought, we would illuminate both of our spaces. Both of our spaces, like the times when I'm in a war of your galaxy, when you shine bright like the star that you are. But no, I was mistaken. I've been mistaken so many times, again and again. I ask myself, where are my people? My people are not here. I have not found them yet. Thank you. And this one is called Gatekeeping. This one in particular is about, um, I was thinking, when I wrote this one, I was thinking about the political environment that we have to live within. And 
sometimes that we are attributed as having the similar characteristics to the people in power when actually we are so far removed from them in terms of our beliefs and our uh, uh, values. Um, so this is what this one's about. Gatekeeping. Do we have a choice on the austerities of our time, our mind, our life? Gatekeepers who open doors at their whim, leaving them ajar way after the holding hour. Enticing another wanderer, another stroll down the same track, leaving us hopeless by the roadside, abandoned by the wayside. Sometimes we see the light and we feel its warmth and then we gravitate like fretful moths towards gilted lands to find only an illusion, like the treacherous haze of a mirage cloaking dry, burnt, hard beaten rock. These barren wastelands leave nothing to the imagination. They are final, absolute, fair and honest in their brutality. If we were to hold you within our hands, do you think we would gatekeep you? Stand sentry to your soul, measuring your worth from the weighty rattle and click of cold, broken and rusty keys? In our world, there would be no second guessing. No ownership at all of the games that you play, no sway of our might from the frames of day to night. In our world, we would all evolve from nothing to something to everything. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I've just got a couple more for a tree. Is that OK? Um, yeah, I've got time. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, I've okay. got time. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the last couple of poems. Um, all I'm going to say is I want I want you to think about. Um, for me, no national, no nationalism, no patriotism, just us in our space, our lives within a long kind of frame of eternity basically no borders is what i'm saying leafy whispers when i close my eyes i return to the realms of yesterday to a lifeless pond to the silent mill the place where i can tiptoe barefoot along the soft moss of corridors past my hand trailing along the cascades that wear away the stony frame from this shadow land there's a slant in the light today it plays with the edges of my soul. It's beckoned soft and golden and light, alive with the borrowed song of birds and brooks and breeze and leafy whispers. Leafy whispers. There's beauty in their story that falls leaf after leaf upon this earth that we now tread. How many seasons have folded, replacing my footsteps with yours and replacing yours with the timeless weight of theirs. And then this is my final poem, it's very short. It's called Potential. Potential. Fragmented, refractory. Light framing the shoulders of this languid time. Know this much. Whether you are to choose between the paths or the shadows or tiptoe between the patches of earth and air, fire and water, with your pockets of stone and pockets of sand and pockets of brittle seed and pockets of lamb, it would always mean that you were enough, more than enough for this beautiful plan. That's it, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I just want to, um, we're finished now with all the acts and everything. I just want to thank all the poets and storytellers and everyone um, you contributed for con agreeing to contribute and for being here tonight. Um, thanks to the audience members for coming and supporting the event. Um, so I'm going to close it down now. So um, in the Britain we live in today, it's impossible to, I think, to move through many parts of this country without also seeing how um, um, inter um, interracial and um, intercultural unions and families and so on. Um, but today's story is also historically dependent because Britain has always been a place of multiple peoples and heritages and so on. Um, 
So <clears throat> academic, uh, professional and personal interests in racial mixing and mixedness have occurred in the last few decades, um, including by organizations like, like the Mixed Museum and also um, critical mixed race studies. Uh, furthermore, um, organizations like the, like the Blindian Project in the UK, as well as um, mixed monologues in the US context. Um, there are more, I think, experience-led accounts being published as well, while trends as well in broadcast media show a greater presentation. Um, but does more visibility mean representat representation? I think that's, I'll leave that as an open question um, in the sense that does, is all visibility good in, in that sense, um, in our films, in our TV programs, in our media, and so on. Um, so in this event, we have picked up the surface of mixed heritage perspectives on, her on heritage, race, identity, culture, and history, and more in, in Britain, including individuals, families, and communities. Uh, lots more can be considered and talked about, but this goes beyond events like this. I think we need to carry a lot of the subjects today. I've been talked about into our day-to-day -day lives and educate people that are connected to us, um, our families and our friends and, and so on. So now in the years to come, there'll be more books, articles, videos, films that will challenge and also add um, to the literature, so to speak. Um, but now, um, I'm going to end now, and I hope that tonight has gone a little way to opening minds and inviting people um, to this reality in Britain we live, to, we live in today, um, a multi-layered um, Britain showing mixed heritage people, couples and families are, are complex, diverse, and also a historically um, uh, linked group of residents in this country too. This should be an un uncontroversial fact, but the official history um, says otherwise. And I'll just by end in saying that if you don't control your narrative, um, somebody else will tell your story for you and they won't always tell it well either. Um, so yeah, um, thanks every very much everyone for coming tonight. Um, and I'm gonna stop the recording.